August 27th, 1992. Tupelo, Mississippi. 13-year-old Lee Ochi is left home alone for the day while her mother goes to work. Since Hurricane Andrew has moved over the area, Lee's mother attempts to check on her, but discovers that she has vanished from the house, and all signs point to foul play. One month later, Lee's mother has mailed an envelope containing Lee's glasses, but the identity of the person who sent them is unknown. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone, and welcome to the latest mini-sode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and today we will be chronicling a pretty bizarre missing persons case, the 1992 disappearance of 13-year-old Lee Ochi. Not too long ago, this story was requested by two separate listeners named Holly and Catherine within the span of a few days. In fact, Holly lives in the area where this disappearance took place. I was familiar with this case before, and always thought it sounded pretty strange, so I figured this would be an ideal time to cover it on the podcast especially since it's going to be reaching its 25th anniversary in August. There are many unusual aspects to this mystery, not the least of which is that a young girl happened to vanish from her home under suspicious circumstances during the most destructive hurricane in the history of the United States, though it doesn't sound like the hurricane played much of a role in this story. While doing research online, I can't recall coming across a case with more gossip and rumors than this one, as it appears that a lot of people from the area have their own personal opinions about what happened here. So the big challenge with putting this mini so together was to separate the facts from the innuendo but I'll get to that momentarily. Before we get started, just a brief reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes and shorter mini-sodes like this one. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new mini-sode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll be sure to give you a shout-out on a future episode. So with all that out of the way, let us now examine the unsolved disappearance of Lee Ochi. Our story begins in Mississippi in 1992, our central figure is 13-year-old Lee Ochi, who lives with her 36-year-old mother, Vicki Felton. Lee was born on a military base in Honolulu, Hawaii on August 21, 1979, as both her parents, Vicki and Donald Ochi, were serving in the army at the time. However, they divorced less than two years later, and Donald was transferred to a military installation in Germany. So Vicki moved to Tupelo, Mississippi with her daughter, and eventually got married to a man named Barney Yarborough. However, several weeks before the events in this story took place, Vicki and Barney separated, so Barney moved out of their house into his own apartment. At around 7.40 a.m. on the morning of August 27th, Vicky left her daughter at home while she headed to work. Lee's grandmother was planning to pick her up that afternoon to take her to an open house at her new school, as Lee was scheduled to start 8th grade within the next two weeks. Until then, however, Lee was on her own, and this would mark the very first time her mother had ever left her at home by herself. Now this was a bit of a concerning time to be home alone, because Tupelo was in the midst of some torrential rainstorms and heavy winds because Hurricane Andrew was moving over the area. In case you're not familiar with it, Hurricane Andrew was a Category 5 hurricane which began in the Central Atlantic on August 16th. For the next week and a half, it would wreak havoc through the Bahamas and the Gulf Coast at wind speeds of up to 165 miles per hour and become the most destructive hurricane in United States history. It would do its greatest destruction in South Florida, and in total, the hurricane claimed 65 lives and caused $26 billion in damage. By the time it reached Mississippi on August 27th, Hurricane Andrew had died down considerably and deteriorated to tropical depression status but the stormy weather was still a cause for concern. Lee was afraid of thunderstorms, and her mother claimed that they spent the night sleeping in the same bed together. So at 8.30, Vicky decided to check on her daughter by calling her at home, but there was no answer. Vicky immediately became concerned and phoned her own mother to ask her to go check on Lee. However, the anxiety seemed to be too overwhelming for Vicky, so she decided to rush home to check on Lee herself. When she arrived, she was surprised to discover that her daughter was not at the house. There were no signs of forced entry, but one of the doors to the house was unlocked, and the garage door was open. Vicky would claim that it was her habit to put down the garage door whenever she left the house, but she could not remember if she did so on this particular day. But most disturbingly, there were signs that a violent struggle had taken place. Blood and hair was stuck to the doorframe of Lee's bedroom, and a trail of blood led from the hallway to the living room to the back door. There were also bloodstains on the wall, and a large pool of blood on the carpet in the hallway, so the evidence seemed to suggest that someone had suffered a serious head injury. Vicky also noticed that Lee's nightgown and one of her bras were inside a laundry basket with bloodstains on them. So Vicky immediately contacted the police, 
and reported her daughter missing. When police investigated the scene, they found remnants of blood on the countertop in the bathroom. This seemed to indicate that someone had attempted to clean themselves up, but no bloody towels or rags could be found anywhere. When they checked the pool of blood on the carpet, they determined that it was fresh and hadn't been there for very long. All the blood in the house turned out to be type O, but since there was no actual record of what type of blood Lee had, no one could conclude with 100% certainty that it belonged to her, though it seems pretty likely that it did. It also turned out that Lee's reading glasses were missing from the home, along with her shoes, a pair of shorts, and a sleeping bag. Unfortunately, investigating a disappearance was not so easy when the community was dealing with the effects of a hurricane. When police attempted to search the area with bloodhounds, the stormy weather made it impossible for the dogs to pick up a scent. Even after the storm subsided, no one was able to find any trace of Lee. Anyway, after the disappearance received coverage in the media, there was a reported sighting of Lee inside a vehicle with a man at a McDonald's in the town of Boonville, which is located 30 miles outside of Tupelo. However, police were able to track this man down and determine that the girl in question was not Lee. Well, the case took a very bizarre turn on September 9th when an envelope postmark from Boonville arrived at Vicki Felton's home. Her address was 105 Honey Locust Drive, though Honey was misspelled on the envelope H-O-N-Y. Curiously, it was addressed to Lee's stepfather, Barney Yarborough, even though he was separated from Vicky and had moved out of the residence several weeks earlier. Well, when the envelope was opened, it contained Lee's missing reading glasses. Forensic tests would be performed on the glasses and envelope, along with some handwriting tests, but they were unable to uncover any useful evidence to determine who the sender might be. When DNA testing was performed on the stamp, there was no DNA to be found, as whoever mailed the envelope had used water to attach the stamp, rather than licking it. In November of 1993, there was another false lead, when a skull was found in a soybean field in Monroe County. Initially, the state medical examiner positively identified the skull as belonging to Lee, and it was even printed in the papers, but this turned out to be a mistake, and the skull actually belonged to another missing girl. Investigators started looking at possible suspects in the disappearance. At the time she went missing, Lee's father, Donald Ochi, was still in the army and stationed at Fort Myer in Virginia. In spite of the distance between them, they were able to maintain a close relationship. Donald was granted emergency leave from the army, so he could move to Tupelo and assist in the search efforts, and he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. Lee's stepfather, Barney Yarborough, was given a polygraph, and he passed. He was very cooperative with investigators, assisted with the search efforts, and has also been ruled out as a suspect, but he has since passed away. Vicki Felton, on the other hand, she was given three polygraphs, one by a local polygraph examiner and two by the FBI, but she failed all of them. That said, Vicki has never been named as a suspect, and she has always had her eyes on another potential suspect, a local man who held a position of trust at the church Lee attended and was acquainted with her. In 2000, this man went to prison for kidnapping and raping a young girl who was around Lee's age. He has never been named publicly, but he has also apparently been looked at as a possible suspect in two other disappearances from the area, and he's scheduled to be released from prison in 2019. However, no evidence has ever been found to tie this man or any other suspect to Lee Ochi's disappearance, and she has remained missing for nearly 25 years. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So, like I said in my intro, if you were to do an online search about this case, you'll come across a lot of gossip and rumors in places like the Topics Forum and the comment sections of articles about this case, and they don't often paint Vicki Felton in a favorable light. As an example, one story you'll come across in multiple places is how Lee would show up to school with black eyes and have flimsy explanations for how she got them. Well, I'm not from the area, I don't know any of these people, so I'm going to approach this case as a detached outside observer and just focus on the reported facts from credible sources. I have no idea if there's any truth to the rumors that there was abuse in Lee's household. I mean, it could be true, but it's never been reported publicly. It's also possible there was abuse, but it has no connection to her disappearance. I don't know. But while it's possible that Lee was abducted by an unknown party, these rumors and gossip add a lot of fuel to the fire that Lee's mother was actually responsible for her disappearance. Here's an exact quote the Tupelo police captain used to describe Vicki Felton in an article. There were times that we didn't feel she was being as forward as we thought a mother should be but we didn't go so far as to call her a person of interest or to say she was a suspect. I think there are many circumstances of Lee's disappearance which have caused some people to question Vicky's story, most especially the coincidental timing of the whole thing. This was apparently the first time Lee had ever been left home alone, and within an hour or so of her mother leaving the house, an unknown intruder just happens to abduct her. There are also no signs of forced entry, and one of the doors was unlocked. This story is a bit reminiscent of my podcast about the disappearance of Jonelle Matthews, and that one, a 12-year-old girl just happened to vanish during a 1 hour and 15 minute window where she was home alone on a school night. If there was an abductor, they either had to be extremely lucky, or they had to have been watching the victim and knew they were going to be alone at this particular time. But what makes Lee's disappearance so unusual is that it took place while Hurricane Andrew was moving over the area, 
and there were heavy rains and wind. It really does not seem ideal to attempt an abduction in such terrible weather conditions. One of the things which has created suspicion about Vicky's story is that she attempted to phone Lee from work less than an hour after she left the house, and immediately panicked and rushed home when Lee didn't answer. According to Vicky, she had a coded system for phoning Lee. Vicky would call the house, let the phone ring two times, and then hang up in order to signal to Lee that her mother was calling. Vicky claimed that she did this, and attempted to phone Lee again, but Lee did not pick up after several rings. Since Vicky claimed this was the first time Lee had ever been left home alone, it seems strange that they would have this system for making phone calls, but who knows, maybe they discussed it, and implemented it earlier that morning, or the night before. But then Vicky calls her own mother, and asks her to check on Lee, yet she becomes so anxious, that she decides not to wait, and immediately leaves work in order to go check on Lee herself. She does this even though her workplace is about a 10-15 to 15 minute drive from her house, while Lee's grandmother only lives 5 minutes away. But it sounds like Vicky still arrived at the house long before the grandmother did. I guess you could chalk all this up to Vicky being an overly paranoid mother, but to some, frantically rushing home from work to discover her daughter missing comes across as an attempt to fabricate an alibi for herself. Another strange inconsistency is that Lee's nightgown had bloodstains on it, but Vicky claimed that Lee had been wearing a nightshirt and green and yellow boxer shorts when she last saw her. Though, to be fair, just because the nightgown had blood on it doesn't necessarily mean Lee was wearing it, as the perpetrator could have just grabbed it when they needed something to clean up the blood. And herein lies another thing which has created skepticism about Vicky's story. If an intruder entered the home to abduct Lee and caused an injury to her head, why would they go to the trouble of trying to clean up the scene? There's also the fact that a sleeping bag was missing from the home. It seems to be a likely thing to use to transport Lee's body, but would an intruder have even known where to find a sleeping bag inside the house? Of course, the most bizarre aspect of this case is when Vicky was mailed an envelope containing Lee's glasses. It's very odd that it was addressed to Lee's stepfather, even though he did not live at the house anymore, and it doesn't look like he had any involvement in Lee's disappearance but it seems awfully suspicious that it was mailed from the town of Boonville immediately after there had been a sighting of Lee there, even though it turned out to be false. Since there was no logical reason for anyone to mail these glasses, you could interpret the whole situation as a deliberate attempt to mislead the investigators. So maybe the sighting of Lee in Boonville prompted Vicky to drive there to mail the glasses in order to lend some credence to her abduction scenario. I also find it very interesting that the person who mailed the envelope never licked the stamp and used water to apply it. I know that quite a few mysteries have been solved by extracting DNA from a postage stamp, but DNA testing was still a relatively new thing in 1992, so it's surprising that someone would have the foresight to do that. However, if Vicky was behind the whole thing, what motive would she have had for killing her daughter? Again, you'll find a lot of gossip and rumors on the internet about Lee being a victim of abuse. I know that Vicky and her husband had recently separated, so if she blamed Lee for ruining the relationship, this could have been a source of some tension in the household which escalated into violence. It's possible that Vicky didn't intend to kill Lee, but the evidence at the scene points to a serious head injury, so it's possible that Vicky accidentally caused her daughter's death by striking her and causing her to fall over and hit her head on the bedroom's doorframe. Vicky then makes an attempt to clean up the scene, disposes of Lee's body somewhere, travels to work like she normally does every morning in order to fabricate an alibi, and then goes through the charade of attempting to phone Lee, rushing home in a panic, and discovering that Lee's gone missing after a violent struggle. Well, I think there's one key piece of evidence which might negate this entire scenario. Here's an exact quote from the Tupelo police captain about the pool of blood found on the carpet. The blood wasn't hard. It didn't have what I call a skin over the top of it. It was fresh. This strongly suggests that the injury which caused this blood occurred very recently, and it was established that Vicky would have been at her workplace at least an hour before the police arrived at the scene. If Lee had been killed in the middle of the night or something, then it's plausible that Vicky could have gotten rid of her body and then traveled to work in the morning to establish her alibi. But if the blood evidence was fresh, then it just doesn't seem possible that Vicky would have had enough time to dispose of Lee's body so thoroughly that it hasn't been found in nearly 25 years before showing up at work. Furthermore, if Vicky was attempting to fabricate an alibi, she went about it in the most illogical way. Why attempt to phone Lee and then rush home after being at work for less than an hour? One of the main reasons people are skeptical of her story is because they don't find it plausible that someone else could have abducted Lee from the house in such a narrow time frame. So if Vicky wanted her story to seem more plausible, she could have just continued working for the next couple of hours before going through the charade with the phone call. This leaves open a much wider window of time for a potential abduction and would add more credibility to her story. I also know it's tempting to doubt Vicky because she failed three lie detector tests, which is a bit unusual, but we all know how unreliable polygraphs could be, so I wouldn't consider that too damning. And there's one other little thing which makes me question Vicky's guilt. In August of 1994, Vicky wrote a letter to the editor of the newspaper The Hattiesburg American. The same state medical examiner who mistakenly identified the skull as belonging to Lee had screwed up again with something else, and Vicky wrote in to complain about all the pain and suffering this examiner had caused with her mistakes. If Vicky was responsible for Lee's disappearance, I would think she'd prefer to lay low and move on, instead of putting the case back into the spotlight two years later. Now, you can be skeptical about the idea of a random intruder making an attempt to clean up the crime scene, but remember, 
This was a very half-assed job at cleaning up the scene, since they left an entire pool of blood behind. However, if Vicky's story is true, then there's a plausible explanation for this. Someone could have been in the midst of cleaning up the blood until they heard the phone ring because Vicky was calling. This may have spooked them, and caused them to flee the scene with Lee's body. So if this scenario is true, then who could have been the perpetrator? Well, since there were no signs of forced entry, it seems logical that Lee was killed by someone she knew, and her mother has already pointed to a pretty promising suspect. We have a man from Lee's church who is currently in prison for kidnapping and raping a young girl, and Lee apparently knew and trusted this guy. It's possible he could have learned that Lee would be home alone that particular day, or he'd become fixated on her and was watching the house and decided to move in when he saw Vicky leave for work. If Lee was comfortable with this man, she easily could have let him inside the house. It may not have been his intention to kill Lee, but if he was looking to take advantage of her, things might have escalated into violence, which led to Lee banging her head on the bedroom doorframe, causing a fatal injury. Since this guy isn't a complete stranger to the family and wants to cover his tracks, he starts making an attempt to clean up the scene, but when the phone starts ringing because Vicky is calling, he gets spooked, so he finds a sleeping bag, wraps Lee's body in it, flees the scene, and eventually disposes of her. For reasons unknown, he takes Lee's glasses with him and decides to mail them to Vicky a few weeks later from Boonville, possibly because he learned of the false sighting of Lee there. Since this man is currently incarcerated for a heinous crime, it sounds like he's capable of doing something like this, but I don't really know that much about him, and there's no evidence that he's responsible for Lee's disappearance. But the theory I just described seems more plausible to me than Vicky Felton being the perpetrator. Like I said, I'm not from the area, so I don't know how much truth there is to all these rumors about Vicky, and I might feel a bit differently about the scenario if it had not been established that the blood evidence found at the scene was fresh. For that reason, I just don't think it would have been physically possible for Vicky to have committed this crime in such a narrow time frame. I think Lee's death was the result of the actions of a very calculated predator, and if these events didn't happen to transpire at the tail end of the worst hurricane in American history, then I'm not sure there would have been as much skepticism about the idea that Lee was abducted. I think that Hurricane Andrew is something of a major red herring in this case, as all these events probably would have transpired the exact same way even if there was no hurricane. But of course, I could be wrong about my theory, and there may be good reason to suspect Vicky, but there just isn't any solid evidence which points to anyone in particular. However, we're approaching the 25th anniversary of Lee's disappearance, so this would be an ideal time for some evidence to surface, and hopefully provide closure. So if you have any information about the unsolved disappearance of Lee Ochi, please contact the Tupelo Police Department at 662-841-6491. That's 662-841-6941. But if you just have your own theory about what happened, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to thank all my listeners who suggested this case, along with my supporters at the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit and the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online forum. I also wanted to send an appreciative shout-out to a pair of new donors from this week named Sage and R. Castro, so thank you very much, guys. And I need to remind everyone that we are only one week away from CrimeCon, which is being held at the JW Marriott Hotel in Indianapolis from June 9th into the 11th. As you've probably heard, I'm going to be appearing on Podcast Row representing The Trail Went Cold, and I could not be more excited to meet my fellow podcasters and my listeners. Now, I've mentioned before that CrimeCon is going to be holding a private party for The Trail Went Cold on Friday, June 9th from 6 until 7 p.m., and if you used our special 20% off promo code to purchase your tickets, your name is on a list, and you are automatically invited to attend. I still don't know the exact space where the party will be held, but it's going to be at the hotel somewhere, and I'll keep you posted when I receive more details. And I'm pleased to announce a special treat for those of you attending the party. I have recorded a mini-sode to be released the week following CrimeCon about an unsolved murder which took place at an Indianapolis hotel. And I am going to be delivering an exclusive early live reading of this mini-sode for you guys. I figure there's going to be an open bar, so if I suck, hopefully no one will care. Now, I wish I could invite every one of you listeners to this party, but because space is limited, it will probably be restricted to those of you who used our 20% off promo code. But to make it up for those of you who cannot attend... Each and every person who comes to meet me on Podcast Row will receive a link to the minisode, so you'll all get early access to listen to it before it's officially released. So if you haven't purchased tickets to CrimeCon, but still want to make last-minute plans to attend, please visit CrimeCon.com and receive a 20% discount by entering the promo code TTWC20. That's TTWC20. Hope to see you there! I need to provide a big thanks to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. And like I mentioned earlier, we have a donate button on our website, so if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So have yourself a good week, and join me next Wednesday for a brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold.